The Unshackled Waves, episode 171. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, first of all, I'd like to apologize in, for the delay in getting new Waves episodes out. As you know, the Unshackled team was in Melbourne for the Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux uh, event last Friday night. So there was that and a lot of other business for us to all discuss. Added to that, we've been having some te technical difficulties with a camera dying, but you've all seen our highlights from last Friday, so that should have kept you occupied. But on with the news of the week. The five Super Saturday by-elections are happening this weekend. So on today's show, we'll provide a comprehensive preview in the lead up to our live stream Saturday night, as well as other Australian political news of the week with the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, it's been a while. As I said in my introduction, there's been some uh, technical issues and uh, we've been quite busy down here in Melbourne, but we're, we're back to uh, wrap up what's, what's been a pretty big week in uh, Australian politics. Indeed it has. Um, Lauren Southern is well and truly in the country, along with Stefan Molyneux, which a lot of people seem to forget. Uh, her tours are going well, it's in addition to the $68,000 bill that Vic Pohl billed the organisers. Um, and of course, Emma Hussar getting in a lot more trouble with the media and the electorate than she expected. Yes, there's certainly been a lot happening, but the, the big event that's happening uh, this weekend is uh, Super Saturday, which uh, uh, we've got our live stream on that night, and you're uh, heavily involved in one of the campaigns up there in Longman in, in North uh, Brisbane. So let's start off with the, the latest polls. So it had the, the LNP leading 51-49 in Longman, and it uh, had uh, Labor uh, leading 52-48 in Braddon, which is in Tasmania. They're the two uh, marginal seats which everyone is uh, focused on, and it could really go either way at the moment. Absolutely. Um, as we discussed last week, Big Trev Ro um, Rothenberg had a few issues with um, a mistake made on his official biography, but it doesn't seem on the whole, it doesn't really seem that the fallout from that will really affect his chances that much. At this stage, it doesn't seem like the, there will be any fallout from that, at least not in terms of the by-election itself. Yeah, I think everyone's moved on from uh, that scandal last week. It, it was a bit of a nothing scandal. I mean, it was uh, obviously embarrassing, but there was also a poll uh, done on that. 40% uh, of Longman voters believed it was an honest mistake, 32% uh, purposeful, and 27% said it was a careless uh, mistake. Uh, so, so that 32% was probably never going to vote for him anyway. I'm not sure if, if, if those people would even respect the armed forces. Well, there are quite a few veterans still living in Longman. One of the things about Longman that you've got to remember is that it has one of the highest per capita, both boomer and what you'd call millennial demographics. There are more boomers per capita and more millennials per capita in Longman than in most other electorates in the country. So there would have been more than a few who would have fought in the wars, um, World War II, Korea, the Malaya emergency, um, Vietnam, and even a few who would have fought and served in East Timor. So the, there, are, there is still a strong um, RSL branch up there in in Longman, uh, in Caboolture, sorry, which is in the seat of Longman. But it's, um, I don't think they would hold him hold it against him that much because of the fact that he's come out he he also apologized to um the rsl saying look i made a mistake i stuffed up i'm sorry it was an honest mistake he came clean and they accept and they seem to have accepted that apology 
Yeah, I, and I know that the, the Liberal Party, they, they wheeled out uh, their veterans, uh, Andrew Hastie and uh, Jim Molan, to sort of uh, calm everyone down, saying, look, it's, it's easy to get these uh, medals confused. But of course, uh, uh, Big Trev, uh, Trevor Ruthenberg and Susan Lamb, they're, they're not the only two major players in this race. There's also One Nation. Uh, Matt Stephen, their candidate, is still... Uh, dogging questions about whether his business uh, owed uh, money and then there's the fact that it was revealed this week uh, Pauline Hansen is on an overseas cruise around uh, Scotland and Ireland and everyone's thinking well there's a there's a week to go until the by-election you're it's Pauline Hansen's one nation Pauline Hansen is off in another nation mm, funny that if I were to be unkind I could say that she was sailing around the British Isles while one nation crashed and burned but in fairness they've actually gone up in the polls though that that, that's the thing they're 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 poised to do quite well in longman there's there's that there's also there are a couple of factors there are a a couple of other factors as well tim um malcolm roberts is spending a lot of time in longman helping out up there as i mentioned last week and while my comment about pauline hanson being overseas while her party is falling apart might be a tad harsh and a tad unfair it's interesting to note that one nation is the most cohesively organized or at least seems to be to the um the average punter's eye the most cohesively organized minor party in uh any of the by-elections not just in longman but in general um people know this is a by-election so people will most likely take the opportunity to say, you know what, stuff the Labour Party, stuff the coalition. Let's just throw a lot in with one nation. Worst case scenario, he can only do nine months worth of damage. Or it's actually more like 11 months of damage, but that's besides the point. He won't be there for long. And if he doesn't do well in the nine to 11 months, and that's assuming Turnbull doesn't do a phraser and call a general election after the by-elections anyway um he won't be um whatever minor party candidate wins in any of the seats not just in longman but in general will not have much of a chance to make an impact anyway so the electorate could very easily punish the major parties by putting in a minor party candidate or or an independent in in any or all of the seats just to say a big f you to the majors and it'll, all, love steam. it'll all come down to the preferences in in longman and all the pollsters are saying the one nation preferences are uh, unpredictable uh, also let's uh, focus on uh, braddon uh, in tasmania where it's interesting that uh, the uh, liberal party they're they're attacking an independent uh, candidate which is craig garland because he had a old conviction for assaulting a uh, policewoman, which has uh, uh, made uh, national news. I'm not sure if uh, Craig Allen's preferences are going to have that uh, big an impact, but he's deemed to be a uh, big enough of a threat to the, the Liberals in that seat uh, since, since they've raised them. Well, as you remember from the Tasmanian state election, the Liberals did very well in Tasmania, and they would be looking at maintaining their strong streak as it were so it would make sense to especially in the light of the fact that sitting governments almost never win by elections in fact i can i can't think of any off the top of my head where they have actually won so it so attacking an independent makes strategic sense for them to um to proceed along that tack and perth and Fremantle, the two uh, wa uh, seats so well they're both uh, safe labor seats where the only threat is the greens the liberals uh, aren't running so not many people have paid attention to those they're just uh, unsure of how much labor will beat the greens by but uh, probably every everyone else was uh, also focusing on mayo in uh, south australia down near the the Adelaide Hills. They were thinking this was going to be uh, close with uh, Rebecca Sharkey, obviously knocked out by a dual citizenship. Uh, she used to be in Nick Xenophon's team, uh, 
party, but obviously since Nick Xenophon's not part of the team anymore, that she's now the, the Centre Alliance, and Georgina Downer ha is the uh, Liberal candidate, uh, Alexander Downer's uh, daughter, who held the seat for uh, 24 years, but she is not actually a local uh, from the area. She is a fly-in from Victoria because she couldn't, sh couldn't get a seat there. And it's looking like that the, the locals, they're, they're not appreciating having a dynasty girl who's flown in from another state as the candidate and Sharky is 18 points ahead of Downer and it's looking like she's easily going to get uh, back in. Mm -hmm. A few weeks ago I would have said that Georgina Downer still had a chance um, because of the fact that she had her family name behind her. However, when I, after I said that last time, and this is where I have to issue a correction to so admit I was actually wrong here, as rare as that is, um, a lot of people on the ground that I've been talking to in the Mayo electorate have actually said, nah, we don't want her, they don't want her, she's not one of us. It, the thing is, Alexander, her father, he was a local, at least he was initially, whereas Georgina is not, and that is a huge, huge impediment to her chances of getting elected in. Her name is not going to be enough to carry the seat. The money that the Liberal Party will no doubt throw behind her is not going to be enough to carry the seat. So it is quite likely, and again, we come back to the main point that the um, that sitting governments almost invariably lose by-elections. So I reckon Sharky's probably got that. Uh, I, I'm eager to say that I was right all along on you. Georgina Downer uh, wouldn't win, so I've been correct in, in, that, in that regard. But of course, yeah, the, the election hasn't been held yet, so I better not get too ahead of myself. But the other big political story this week was the My Health Record or uh, eHealth uh, record. Now, the federal government has created a digital health record uh, database. Uh, now, this was uh, first uh, phased in in 2012, and all of a sudden we're told that we, we must opt out of it in three months, otherwise our records will, will be there forever, and any medical practitioner can access it uh, if, the, if they wish. Uh, and now uh, this is this has basically freaked everyone out. It's like, well, like the government's going to be keeping track of my my health. Uh, this is uh, Big Brother uh, stuff. Uh, who, uh, who knows whether it's uh, secure? And it seems to have snuck up on all of us. And there's been a lot of backlash uh, to it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very telling when you have not just the usual suspects. That is the libertarians saying. Uh, this is big brotherish. This is nanny state. We should be getting as out of it as quickly as we can. You've got people like Peter Van Onselen, who is very much establishment, um, very much normie, saying, "Look, this is a bad idea. We should put be pulling out of this." There are quite a few people lately who have been saying that over the past few days, and some of the people who have been saying it. Have actually surprised me. Peter Van Onselen is the most obvious example, and I think to myself, I knew this was coming, but I didn't realize, with everything else going on, that it would be so critical at this time okay. that they've only got three months left. Because you know you've always been able to opt out of it, but it. Who Every, it necessary yeah. to opt out of it because of the fact at the time that you know having the record there was a good way of ensuring that one practitioner could look you up if you had had to move to another city or another state and you know and say oh this is what you've got you're being treated for this and you have been prescribed that to treat it for example but now there are also not just the and this is the thing that's bugging me the most. It's not just the, um, it's not just the privacy concerns, Tim. It's also the security concerns. There was, I have to choose my words carefully here for obvious reasons, but there were some additional security concerns, like cyber security concerns in mm. regards to, um, uh, in terms of the my health record, and it's that's very troubling because. As much as we don't like to think we are in a 
war of any shape or form. We are, in a way. We've got every major government in the world, including Australia, has its own cyber terrorism and counter cyber terrorism division. And you can you can probably safely bet your bottom dollar that they would be um, testing their skills and sparring both with friendly nations as well as enemy nations. So, you know, say America will say to the UK, here, can you test our new system, for example? They'll say to MI6, can you test our system? And the CIA will say to ASIS, which is our equivalent of the CIA and MI6 here, um, can you test our system as well, and so forth and so forth. And they, were, and, and they would eventually ha have found that there are some very, very serious backdoors into that information that could be exploited by less friendly nations. Yes, yeah, Singapore had their, their national health records uh, hacked. So, and yeah, obviously, uh, what, you, what you did mention there is China is uh, very interested in a lot of information that the Australian government uh, keeps there. They attacked a university uh, recently, which uh, obviously has access to thousands of students' personal information. But what's also concerned people is that this health information, even though we're told that oh, it'll only be for health, other government agencies that whenever there's a database they always want access to it for the tax office law enforcement it's exactly the same thing that happened with metadata we were told that it was only for national security yet all of these government <laughs> agencies wanted wanted access to it when you've when you've got this all, all this information there then of course it's going to be harvested by whichever agency is probably too lazy to to, to find out and ask you yourself not to mention the ability to retain staff saying, oh, we need a new division or we need to create a new division to supervise the collation, the collation and collection of information. So that's another thing as well. But maybe I'm just being too cynical. Yeah. You know, the thing is that you, you mentioned China had done a cyber attack on the university. And that's the one we know of. Like I said before, you can bet that there are plenty of other hacking attacks that are either thwarted or that are successful and we don't necessarily hear about because it's embarrassing for any governments or any organizations affected by such attacks. Uh, the Australian Medical Association, uh, no fan of uh, small government, they've basically seen the, the writing on the wall, the backlash to this uh, My Health record and said, oh, you know, we're not comfortable with this. And now the pressure is on the, uh, the health minister, Greg Hunt, who <laughs> is quite a nanny statist himself. They, there's, you can see that there's going to be some sort of back down. And I'm, I'm quite glad and proud of Australians who for, for too long have, have just accepted these intrusions. They've like seen this on the news and said, what? They're, they're getting access to my information. How dare they? And ringing up their, their MPs and saying, what are you doing? I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this. It's, it's actually been quite inspiring to see. Mm hmm. We do have a tendency in Australia to be very trusting of our government compared to the Americans who are basically borderline paranoiacs in terms of the government. But even Australians are starting to wake up and say, hang on, what is the government doing? Stop. We are asking a question. We want to know what's going on here. So they're finally starting to wake up. We are finally starting to wake up. Another issue that uh, re-emerged uh, this past week was uh, African crime gangs in Melbourne. Uh, now, Malcolm Turnbull was in Melbourne uh, last week. He was asked by Neil uh, Mitchell, uh, uh, is there a problem with uh, African crime and gangs? And he said, oh, you'd have to be uh, block your ears to, to not hear about it. And uh, Greens MP, uh, member for Melbourne, Adam Bant, uh, uh, said that he and Peter Dutton were, were racist and not welcome in Melbourne. And Waleed Ali did one of his 
uh, monologues where we were told he smashed Malcolm Turnbull on uh, African crime in, in Melbourne. Waleed Ali claimed that, oh, I only ever hear about it on talkback radio. And uh, Catherine Deveney, the alleged comedian, uh, said that she only feared uh, becoming a victim of crime from white cunts. And Yasmin abdel Magid said that, oh, when I'm in Melbourne, I must be part of the, uh, the African gang. But as all this was happening, there was the, the death of a 19-year-old uh, African uh, teenager, Lao Chu, after a riot uh, between uh, rival African groups at a, another Airbnb rental at the EQ uh, Tower in Melbourne. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it wasn't good timing for all the people saying, oh, Turnbull's such a racist, done such a racist. It wasn't good timing for them, was it, Tim? Oh. It's a tragedy, you know? It's a tragedy. The thing is, is, you know, a kid died because gang violence, and it doesn't matter if it's African gang or Asian gang or whatever gang, the fact is someone died because of organised criminal groups running amok because Daniel Andrews doesn't have the backbone to empower the police to smack down crime and criminals in his state and you know there are so many re there's plenty of reasons why victorians are coming up to queensland even though we don't have the vlad laws anymore we're still a damn sight safer hell sydney is safer than melbourne that should tell you something and you know walida lee likes to go and say oh you know walida lee is an expert at misconstruing and missing the point he will say anything to pander to the social justice warrior mm. snowflake class and sorry demographic them the class they're demographic technically he will say anything to pander to them even though he probably he probably privately i wouldn't be surprised if he privately actually agreed with what was being said but here's the issue and this is probably where i'm going to go uh, more personal than i would usually go the thing is if you ha if you are bringing and it comes to immigration as well if you are accommodating and welcoming people who come from a, a cultural background that is not compatible with the host nation then there is going to be an issue if you are not doing enough to provide a safe society for everyone then there are going to be how did Thomas Aquinas put it? Pestilent persons who are going to be taking advantage of that void in order and social cohesion to run amok and create uh, create discord and tension and commit crimes. So it's going to happen um, in regards to any place that has weak law and order and weak social fabric. The Remember? thing is, there is a problem with African gangs in Melbourne. That's the thing. Turnbull was completely right when he said that. You don't have these problems in Sydney or in Brisbane. And, you know, I actually have a few um, Sudanese friends. They're lovely people. They don't have the desire to be in gangs. They don't have the desire to run around, break into jewellery shops, traumatise poor retail girls and retail clerks you know so what is it about melbourne the fact is it the fact is it the fact that and i have to be very careful here very careful here tim uh is it the fact that the judges are too soft is it the fact that the police are too soft is it the fact that the premier doesn't seem to care what is it about melbourne that makes the gang so violent and so newsworthy compared to other parts of the country. Well, Peter Dutton and Alan Tudge made the point that there's Sudanese people living in Sydney and Brisbane, and there's not that problem there, which is clearly exactly. it's a it's a law and order issue. And uh, another point to make is that remember uh, Eurydice Dixon's death uh, a month ago. That was considered such a horrific event that there were feminists writing that we needed a cur curfew for all men, but. When it when it comes to reporting on this uh, African girl's death, the the, the News Corp uh, journalist uh, Brianna Travers, who 
uh, she interviewed the, the, the grieving mother and uh, cousin, uh, and they said like how how much of a lovely girl she was and that they hope they get the uh, uh, the attacker. Uh, uh, Brenna Travers was was attacked for for simply reporting on African crime. I mean, it's the the victim in this case was African, but even mentioning that there's crimes by people of African descent, you're not actually allowed to discuss that at all or report on it. Hmm. It's an egregious double standard, and it seems like certain people will only be happy when that double standard is maintained. I mean, we're not there yet, thank God, but look at what happened in... What was that city? Was it Ro Rotherham? Ro Ro Rotherham, the English town. Yeah. Well, you, you for those of you who follow um, British news... You'll know exactly what I'm talking about, and Tim, you definitely know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, you can't report on it because ooh, it might offend people. Yeah, the news is not ridiculous. supposed to be subjective. The news is supposed to be, ob well, if not objective, at least impartial. And that's what our friends—I use the word loosely—in the fourth estate need to remember. And lo and behold, uh, that uh, after this girl's death, there were some more uh, crime statistics that were uh, released. And remember, these are uh, actual statistics. Remember, they're, they're not just talkback people making things up. It revealed that Sudanese-born Australians are 57 more times more likely to be charged with aggravated robbery than their Australian counterparts, and 33 times more likely to be charged with riot and affray. Now, despite making up 0.15% of Australia's population. They're the second highest nationality group to commit aggravated burglaries and robberies in the state of Victoria. Mm. It's, a da it's a damning revelation to hear that. And you, the question that is asked is why? I mean, I don't have all the answers, obviously, but you've got to ask yourself, why is one group more flagrant and more represented proportionally speaking than other groups you've got to start asking those questions emma hussar is the labor member for lindsay now not many people would have known uh, who she was a couple of weeks ago but they certainly know who she is now and they don't have a very favorable opinion of her she is accused of uh, bullying her electric staff she has lost 20 staff in just uh, two years she's been a uh, MP when there's only uh, four positions uh, in her office. She has allegedly called staff uh, cunts, fuckwits, and said to a male staff member to do the dishes to learn about uh, white uh, male uh, privilege. And uh, this this was the other thing. It wasn't just abuse. It was abuse of taxpayers' funds because she wasn't getting them to do electorate at work. She was getting them to do, as I just said, the dishes, uh, babysitting, and even walk the dog and pick up after it. Mm. It's interesting to know Mark Latham actually had a conversation on the radio this morning about it with Ben Fordham, I believe it was, um, calling her out for her egregious misuse of taxpayer funds. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard to not feel sorry for her i mean her story of... well, i don't care about her story it's I mean, we'll get to that in a moment it's not an excuse for appalling behavior oh absolutely not absolutely not but there are some of us in the country who might feel a little more lenient towards her because of her story but well, because of her history that being said however i'm with you i don't think that her history should mitigate any um, repercussions for her dubious behavior, especially not just in regards to how she treats her staff, but also in regards to misappropriation of taxpayer funds. Yes, she's a single mother of uh, three, and in a maiden speech, she talked about uh, she was a domestic violence survivor, both as a child and an adult, she said, for 
Um, 29 out of my 36 years I've uh, suffered uh, domestic violence, there was a lot of tears and she gained a lot of mutual respect, but a lot of people would be horrified that this woman who survived abuse has now allegedly turned into an abuser herself. I mean, as I said before, that's no excuse and there's plenty of people, I think it's insulting to say that just because you've experienced uh, abuse uh, as, a, as a child and growing up that uh, you're, uh, you're destined to become an abuser yourself. Mm -hmm. well, it comes back, that part comes back to the nature versus nurture debate. And there is the, it's a rather horrible thing to say, but I've heard that I've heard it. Um, the, the abused become the next generation of abusers themselves. It's a sad thing. The thing is, they should know better. You know, if you if you if you live in an abusive household, whatever the case may be, emotional, physical, verbal, mental, spiritual, sexual, whatever abuse, you know, you should know better than to pass it on and inflict it onto anyone else. That makes you, in 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 some ways, I could actually say it makes you even worse than those who abused you. But you know, I'm not I. I'm not one to judge. Um, it's not my place to judge on that. It's this is the thing though. In regards to Ms. Husser, as she was seen as a star candidate, a star recruit, a star MP for the Labour Party. But apart from a few key backers, the party room does slowly seem to be turning against her for her misappropriation of taxpayer funds and. Let's face it, Barnaby Joyce got, eventually lost his job, ultimately lost his job for the same thing, you know, using his position to give his mistress a better job or another job with another government officer. Um, and there's another article that came out this afternoon in The Australian saying that she had allegedly used her Comcar limousine for trips to her divorce lawyer. You know, and that, that's, you know, but, that's not what the Comcar is for. The Comcar is for electorate work. The Comcar is for travelling to the House of Representatives from your hotel or wherever you're staying in Canberra or to your electorate office from the airport or whatever the case may be. You can't just misappropriate funds. You can't just rot the system and expect to get away with it. Another thing that I found out today, this was just before I left work, um, she made a post in 2016. I don't remember the exact words, but basically she was saying, oh, politicians, what a life. They lie, cheat, cheat and steal. I'd love to be one of them. Um, I'll have to find the text for you later, um, but you'll be able to find the article online anyway yourself if you want to corroborate what I've said. She's officially denied uh, everything. She said she's horrified to learn of these uh, allegations. My office is professional. And she she has been defended by uh, senior Labour people such as Bill Shorten and Anthony Albanese uh, saying she's a hardworking uh, single mother. Uh, even Mike Kelly said that uh, this was uh, misappropriation of funds was excusable because we want uh, more women uh, in, in politics. And, and then, of course, she's now gone on personal leave, not to address these allegations, but due to threats uh, she's uh, received, which uh, I, I guarantee her office has been getting a lot of... Uh, well, I hope uh, people, people, when they're ringing up her office, are, are saying to her uh, staff are probably <laughs> or, uh, already under the pump, can you please pass this on to your uh, boss? We know you're having a hard time. Uh, but uh, yeah, she said that, oh, these uh, threats, I've got to uh, look after my family and work out the next uh, step. She's, she's claiming to be a victim when she's the one that's been victimizing people. Mm -hmm. She's still, stu it seems unfortunately for her that she's still stuck in that victim mentality. Now, I, a, a, a very wise man once said to me, you can either be a victim of your circumstances or you can be a victor over your circumstances. She seems to have still remained in the former rather than moving on to the latter, and that's a shame. 
However, in a position, and this is something that's very important, and this is not just for Ms. Hussar or for Mr. Joyce or for any other politician specifically, this is for all politicians, senators, um, members of the House of Representatives, uh, members of the legislative assemblies, members of the legislative councils, even down to city and shire councillors and aldermen, as they're called. If you are in a public role, you are going to be held to a much higher standard than average Joe or average Jane on the street because you are, you essentially, the ideal is you belong to the people. You are serving the people in whatever capacity. In Miss Hussar's case, it's the people of the seat of Lindsay, was it? The seat of Lindsay? Yes, seat yes. of Lindsay. Um, you serve them. So, you know, you're responsible for, in her case, a hundred odd thousand people whose concerns that you are obligated in your role to represent. You can't allow yourself to be hamstrung by your past. You can't allow your character flaws. And we all know that I'm referring, of course, to a former prime minister here. Well, actually pretty much all the surviving former prime ministers. Um, <laughs> my point is that when you are in a public high profile position, such as a member of parliament, you cannot drop the ball even once. You can't even look like you're about to drop the ball because the media, the electorate and people at large will look at you and they will come down on you like a bag of hammers. And I, especially I, I, in this case, it's, all the all the more horrendous because of her history the fact that she could actually now be doing this to other people uh, most single mothers uh, don't have the the luxury of getting a two hundred thousand dollar salary from the taxpayer if she needs a nanny and a housekeeper then take some money out of that two hundred thousand dollars and and pay for it out of your own pocket like oh, most absolutely. people she have to easily do. afford it she could easily afford it. She could easily afford to pay a nanny $1,000 a week, gross, admittedly, to look after her children and still have hundred and have just under $150,000 per year over. That's not to mention her, uh, the perks of the job, which are, you know, travel allowances, um, travel allowances, travel allowances, accommodation allowances, uh, food allowances. It's some of the expenses that they are entitled to, that the politicians receive as part of their um, remuneration, are just, just makes the eyes water. <laughs> And now there's an internal labor in, in investigation. Most of these staffers are too uh, traumatized to, to speak out in, in public. And so far, labor has been protecting their own. But Lindsay, uh, the seat, it's in the heart of Western Sydney. Uh, labor only just won it back uh, from uh, the Liberals that the, the last uh, election uh, against uh, Fiona Scott, known as the Sex Appeal uh, MP. Uh, so they, they need to win Lindsay Labor to form a government. And I think when it comes to the political uh, push comes to shove, uh, she'll be quietly uh, disendorsed. I mean, if Sam Dastyari can be forced to resign, then a no-name backbencher can be forced to uh, or lose her endorsement. I would generally agree with that, except for what you pointed out earlier, that both Shorten and Albanese are both defending her. The question is, if what you were to suggest, or what you have suggested, rather, is to become fact, uh, an accomplished fact, then you'd have to determine how much Albanese was paying lip service to Hussar's defence and how much of it was genuine. Their, their defence is right. that uh, we knew nothing of these allegations. That's what, uh, sh sh uh, as the Sergeant, Sergeant Schultz defends, I know nothing. That's what uh, Shortner said. I knew nothing of this investigation until I read about it in the newspaper. Oh, pretty much. Sean seems pretty good at that, not, not the Sergeant Schultz defence. But it also depends what faction Hussar is in as well. 
It's another thing. Now, I'm actually not aware of which faction she's in specifically, so I'd have to check with the, in with a source on that. Yeah. Oh well, I I believe it's only a matter of uh, time before she is quietly uh, pushed aside. But it, it just goes to show that this uh, scandal. It always shows that the left they say they're about social justice and compassion, but they're the they're the real bullies. I mean, I live in Victoria. Daniel Andrews is the premier. He's always virtue signalling. He's one of the biggest bullies and thugs you could ever imagine in politics. Mm, that ain't that the truth. It's um. What I was going to say in regards to your other thing, um, in regards to the um, defence, they do tend to defend their own, absolutely. It's the idea of socialism. Everyone is equal except for us at the very top. That's what it's like. How did George Orwell put it in Animal Farm? Uh, All uh, animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I think... I wouldn't say much more on... Um, Miss Husa, but if the Labour Party tries to whitewash this, and they almost inevitably will whitewash it, it will look very bad for them and will further damage not just Shorten as leader, but the Labour Party in general. And if that happens, then there's going to be uh, a lot of room for either a liberal take back or a vote for the greens i mean it's a western sydney seat isn't it yes Lindsay? yes uh, in penrith mm, in penrith mm. still strong labor area as it's, a, it's, a, it's a bellwether seat uh jackie kelly was the the liberal member throughout the the howard years uh david bradbury uh, was the member during the the Rudd Gillard years? So it tends to uh, go uh, with the uh, f with, with the government. So yeah, it's it's definitely going to be uh, one to watch. I don't think we'll see uh, a by election for Lindsay, but uh, we'll. Um, I, I think this is certainly something to, to keep an eye on. But thanks once again, uh, Michael, for discussing the, the week in politics uh, with me. And I'll see you again on uh, Saturday night for our uh, Super Saturday uh, live stream. I, I was going to play uh, Elton John's uh, Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting, but copyright law. <laughs> I'm sure we could probably find a way around that anyway if we give them to you credit, of course. But mm. that, maybe we can get Trump, source checked Trump can use Rocket Man, so... Yeah, but what's Elton John going to do? Sue Trump? He'll, he'll yeah. Lose. <laughs> it was good talking to you, Tim. I'll see you Saturday. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. All of our footage is up for the Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux Melbourne event from both in and outside the venue. It's your last chance to get tickets for the Sydney and Brisbane shows. They can be purchased at axomatic.events. You can watch our Super Saturday live stream both on our Facebook page and plus YouTube. The next big name who is coming down under is former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage. Uh, this September, he's visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane, Perth, as well as Auckland. The Campaign Against Racism and Fascism will be back. Uh, they are planning a protest for the Melbourne show uh, because they, they, they just can't wait. Uh, tickets, including various VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. Also, please remember, we can't cover all these events, do these live streams, produce all these podcasts without your support. So please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.